Andrea von Bitter, welcome to the executive talk. Uh, whenever we read something about a startup uh, company, whenever we read about success in, in the Swiss business, there's always talk about Ava. Uh, you're kind of the, you know, the, the poster child of, of, of success stories. You've been called a trailblazer as well. I was wondering, is that, is that only positive? Is that always kind of a compliment for you or isn't it a lot of pressure as well? I guess it's both. Um, I mean, it's definitely a compliment. It's wonderful what we've achieved so far. But I guess at the same time, I mean, we are very aware that that we are a little bit in the spotlight, especially in the Swiss ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to do our best to live up to all the expectations, I would say. Uh, it's quite unusual. I mean, the whole story is quite unusual. But if we, if, we, if we take a look back in history, and the history isn't that long. I mean, it's four or five years. Yeah, and you're already so present in a way. Isn't there a risk as well that you might, you know, that you might burn out too fast or that you, you might think uh, people are getting fed up of our story and, and uh, even of yourself maybe? I absolutely think the risk is there. So it really? depends on it depends on what questions you ask me today and how, how challenging we'll they see. are. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean absolutely. I, I, look, I I do believe. I think it's our job to keep innovating and keep being interesting. But absolutely, I mean, I think we were probably more interesting at the very beginning. But we will we will always bring out interesting things, and that's that's gonna I think feed the whole thing. I and I also hope that there's gonna be other companies that take our place. By uh -huh. the way, so. Uh, yeah, which, which in Switzerland probably isn't. It, it's, it's a bit, you know, it's, the spotlight is probably more on you uh, because it's such a, such a well, comparatively small uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You are in the States now, though. You are you're heading the, the office of Ava in, in, in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, do you see a lot of differences? When, you, when, you, when we talk about that, you know, maybe the different or different perceptions in, in the company and you as well? Well, I mean... Absolutely. I mean, we are, we are really not that important in San Francisco, right? And I think it's a really humbling experience to do that as well. I think with what we've achieved in Switzerland, I think that, that makes us to a certain degree a poster child, as you say, although there's companies in Switzerland that have achieved way more, they're just a bit more under the radar. Um, but I think in San Francisco, that's definitely different. We're a small company in San Francisco that is mostly headquartered in Switzerland. So I guess we get much less attention around that topic. Um, and that is also good for us, I guess. One topic that is always uh, that you draw attention to is, is, is age. And that's a very Swiss thing as well, uh, since you're not even 30 and you already have that success. And you said in an interview once that in, in, in the States, Funny enough, that's not an issue. Yeah. Even as, as a 29-year-old, you, you kind of belong to the older generation already in, in, in the Silicon Valley. Is it, is it that obvious that you know, age is, is a different number in the States than it is here? I really think it is. I think we're in Switzerland, we're still very much more focused on, on hierarchy, experience, age, the roles that you had before, CVs, while as in San Francisco, and I'm not saying in the States in general, I think in San Francisco itself, age, age and experience isn't, isn't as important. Um, I think obviously we hear about like second time founders and that's somehow mm -hmm. good, but I think overall being a founder of a company our size under 30 is not surprising at all. Do you struggle with that sometimes in Switzerland, that with, with all these uh, preconceptions or, or maybe cliches as well, and that you're always being asked about the age and have to talk about it? And, you know, is, it, is she serious enough to, to be able to, to, uh, to pull it through? As you know, in the States, as you just said, it's, it's completely different. Do, do you think we're, we're a bit narrow minded in this, in this regard in Switzerland? See, I actually, I mean, I'm excited by things like that, right? Like, I, I like the fact that I work in a company that allows me to get to the stage where I am right now at my age and with my gender. Um, I mean, we didn't talk about the gender question, but mm -hmm. I get way more asked we'll about my gender we'll than my that. age. Don't worry about it. Um, but, you know, I actually, I'm, I'm really, really happy that I'm in an environment that allows me to be where I am right now. I don't think that would have been possible everywhere and at any time. So, yes, I understand that it draws attention to it and I understand that people ask about it because it's uncommon, but, but I'm excited that I can show that it's somehow possible. Again, you talked about pressure before, I think that's absolutely there, but I do hope in a certain way, the fact that we put ourselves out there and take the risk of having additional pressure encourages other young women to hopefully start their own companies as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a Swiss company and it's based in Switzerland it is Swiss and it is, it is a Swiss idea. You always uh, stress that as well. Mm -hmm. However, you are, you are an international person as well. And when I look back at, 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 your, at your career, I, you studied all over the world, you, you worked all over the world already as well. Mm -hmm. In that regard, are, are, you still, are you still Swiss or do you see yourself more as a kind of a you know, citizen of the world or you could work wherever you want? I think it's a really tough question. So I think, first of all, I do want to stress that it's 
whether Ava is a global company or not, it's not only about my background, I think it's about the team's background. Mm -hmm. We have an unbelievably international team also here in Switzerland. Um, so yes, we are a Swiss company, but we are very proud to employ people from all over the world in our Swiss office as well. Um, and in the other offices that we have, Ava has now five offices all around the world. So we are, we consider ourselves a global company with very strong and deep Swiss roots, which we what are, are happy about. What are these roots? What are What is the Swiss core or the value in the company? I think the Swiss core co mostly comes out of the technology and the science that we yeah. do. So a lot of our science and technology is based out of Switzerland. It comes from Switzerland. And I think also there, if I have the chance, a big compliment to ETH and EPFL, which provide us with a lot of the resources that we need in order to build that. So I think that that is definitely a core of ours. And the second core is also our financing. We still have a lot of our financing actually comes from Switzerland. And then again, most of our team lives here. They might not all be from here, but most of our team for them is Zurich is their home. Um, so I think we are very rooted in Switzerland in some, in some aspects around that. Uh, when you talk about the technology coming from here and, yeah. and that, that kind of uh, ecosystem through the ETH and EPFL, uh, you've talked about this before as well, that you know, we, we, we tend to think uh, the Swiss can only learn from the, the Silicon Valley yeah. and from the United States. You turn it around and say, yeah, there are certain things yeah. where, where Silicon Valley can still learn from us. And uh, that one being one of them, that, uh, yeah. that, that closeness to, uh, to high class education to high class technology, uh, that, that we are kind of at the forefront of that, right? I have always thought that for us as a Swiss company, we were forced very, very early to go international. But I do consider that as one of the greatest assets that we right now have as a company, because we can really have the best of five worlds at the moment, right? Um, and that is wonderful. And I think we were forced to do it very early. But I also see American companies or Silicon Valley companies mm -hmm. that really struggle after they've reached three, 400 people. And then suddenly it's like, oh, the US isn't big enough for us anymore. Let's go to Europe next, right? And it's this big thing. Well, it's for us before we even raised our second financing round, we were already, step, we were right? already in two or three offices. Yeah. So I think we, we set ourselves up for success there by being close to really everything. And that includes that I do very strongly believe that Switzerland has certain assets for startups that you can't find in other places. And I guess the access to education is, is definitely one of those. Access to money, however, is still a problem sometimes in Switzerland. And uh, that's a, a, a struggle for a lot of startup companies as well. Uh, there's always talks about it's, it's difficult to find venture capital, for example. It wasn't a problem for Ava, but uh, for other companies, they struggle a bit more. Is that one of the main kind of key issues in, in also in the startup scene in Switzerland? Do you see it like that as well? I mean, definitely. I think it has gotten a little better, but I still think we have the issue of not having enough venture capital available for startup companies. I would though also add, I think on the one hand, it's the amount of capital, and the second part is where, what's the risk level of that capital that is available. So I think we're getting much better at having more funding for companies. The mm -hmm. question is, are we also increasing our risk level? Because the Valley is not only famous for big funding rounds, they're also famous for big winner-takes-it-all funding rounds, where they just say, I mean, all the companies that are IPOing right now, right? They're basically saying, okay, good. It doesn't matter how much money you lose. Lose that money, it's fine. We know we're going to get our payback mm -hmm. way, way later. And Switzerland still isn't the ecosystem where that is really the mindset. And why is that? Is, is that also a kind of a, a character thing? Or, or, or uh, are we, I mean, there's always talks, we're too risk averse and, 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 and uh, we're, not, we're not the trailblazers uh, that, that exist in the States. Is that the main, the main issue, the main problem? Look, I mean, I think it's interesting because I think you can tell the Swiss people that they're too conservative, but then you need to also warn the Silicon Valley again, like then there's talk of a bubble in the valley, okay. right? So I think it always depends on how you look at investing in general, right? Like how, how conservative or how risky do you want to be? But I think the fact is we see a much more risk happy behavior in the valley than we see in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might come from experience. It might come from the where. It might come from where is the money actually from? Like whose money are we investing through venture capital? So I think there's a couple of reasons for it. But the, the end result is, I think we are definitely willing to take more risks in the valley. Yeah. Uh, how about you personally? I mean, looking through your CV, it's incredible that it's it's quite striking. You always took risks uh, from an early age already. I mean, you have you have uh, led companies before. It's 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 quite unusual to say that. But right after school, uh, you co-founded a, a chocolate company in in India. Uh, then you went into into Ava without mm -hmm. knowing too much about digital health and and that whole ecosystem uh, before. I mean, what drives you in that? 
regard to kind of always uh, to go not to go the easy way and just being being an employee somewhere with a with a good salary that you probably would have, but really take the risk of of okay, I'm I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to I want to take that. I want to be part of it. I think two things. So first of all, I really like to work on things that I really, really care about. And it's much easier for you to work on something that you care about if you can build your own thing. Mm. Because you, can, you don't have to apply to the three companies that you think might do what you like. You can actually build the ecosystem and the company that you like. So, so that has always been a big motivator for me. I think we, building your own company allows you to really build the company that you want to work in every day. So I think that's one thing. And then I think the second part for me is I don't have much to lose. I never had very much to lose. I think after, when I started my first company, I knew I had a job offer from another big company in my back pocket. Mm -hmm. So I knew if this fails, then I can always go back to that company. That company actually sent me an offer when my first company was over. And it was the same thinking. I was like, I could take this now, or I could try one so more thing. So you always had the luxury of choices in that regard. I think we, All a do. lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of people do. And I think that's, that's the thing. And I think that's also what I've really learned in the US. We have access to education here that is really special. I think it's something we don't necessarily appreciate in Switzerland, but the fact that we have access to almost free education is wonderful. And that allows a lot of us to have choices. And it definitely, and I'm, I'm, I was very privileged there. I think I can look back on, on a very good education that would allow me to potentially get a job somewhere else tomorrow if I had to. Mm. So there's not much you know, to lose. I don't need a lot of money for my lifestyle. So like, the worst that could happen is that I have to go start working somewhere else, which really doesn't sound terrible to me. So, so I think that's where I came from. How much, speaking of where you came from, how much is that kind of mindset also, also rooted within you? I mean, education goes through schools, yes. Mm -hmm. It goes through the home as well, through the family. How did your family react to, you know, you being at a very early age already, so, so entrepreneurial and, and taking risks? And, and I think you, you lived two years in, in India when you, had that, when you had that chocolate company. It's, it's quite an unusual path still for Switzerland. So how did, they, how did they react? Did they never say, come on, Leah, why not, why not take a good job in Switzerland, in Zurich, where, where mm -hmm. we're sure that, you know, uh, everything's all right? Um, well, actually, I mean, I came to the whole startup world quite late, I would say. Um, I think the first time I was really thinking about entrepreneurship was probably when I, when I was probably 20 years old or maybe 19 or and so. And that's already but late. I, I believe so. You, yeah. you always hear about those entrepreneurs and then they have their lemonade stand when they're eight mm. and at 12 they start their gardening business. You know, that, that, that wasn't me. I really, I literally didn't think about it. It was when I started in St. Gallen to study, I, I, didn't, I didn't really think mm -hmm. about it. And then it started to come a little later, but it really came because there's things that I wanted to work for, realized I couldn't really, so why wouldn't I build it myself? So I think it came late, but mm -hmm. I mean, we can question that. Um, but support from my family. I mean, I have a family that when I was 22 and I announced them that I'm going to start a chocolate company in India, they said, oh, great. <laughs> have fun, yeah. go. And so I think the support was definitely there um, that I would choose this path and still is. Uh, something that's striking is all the kind of, a kind of co continuous change. I think that's probably one of the signs of, of, of the industry and of the startup uh, mm -hmm. kind of environment as well. Uh, you're changing within the company now, meaning yeah. that you're one of the co-founders. Uh, you, were, you were responsible for marketing. You are still responsible for marketing. Yeah. But uh, from next year on, and it's quite unusual to say, okay, from next year, yeah. which is a, almost a year uh, to go mm -hmm. still, yeah. you will become CEO. Yeah. What will change for you uh, personally once you're, once you're the CEO of the company, once you're the kind of, you know, the chief executive there? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I mean, I think I, I probably grasp it halfway, I would say. I mean, I obviously see what Pascal does on a daily level, mm -hmm. and therefore I he's know... He's one of the co-founders. He's going to the board afterwards, right? Exactly, and yeah. he's the current CEO. Um, I mean, I... I, if we're close, so I know what he's, what he's taking care of on a daily basis. But I do believe, I mean, that's why I know my daily life is definitely going to change in a new role. But I think that's very on the surface. I think, I, think, I mean, my entire team will change. My location will change mm -hmm. because I'll move back to Switzerland. So I think it's going to be quite, quite a lot of things, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, you, you, you deliberately take, take time to do that transition. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you announced it quite early, yes. as I said. So now you have to kind of time to grow into that yeah. role. role. Uh, when you talk about the team, are you worried that they might react differently to you than they do now? Or, you know, that now that they have a different layer in front of them and they know, oh, she's in a different position, that that might change relationships as well? I mean, I, to a certain extent, yes, it will, because by definition, it will mm -hmm. change certain relationships. Um, 
But the good thing is, I think we all know each other quite well. Um, I mean, we've been working with each other for, for quite a long time. So I think they, they know what to expect. Um, they also had to vote me in that position. I have the privilege of having my peers who were asked whether whether I should have that position or not. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I think they know they know pretty much what to expect. It sounds very democratic. Is that the way you 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 kind of want to lead as well? So you know you want to have the the team to have the final say or, or to at least have a have a little say when it comes to decisions of the company as well. I think startups are known for being probably more democratic than, than other companies, and I think we we definitely do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it's also necessary. I mean, I'm I'm not the expert on a lot of topics. You pointed out before that I didn't know much about digital health a couple of years ago. I definitely know more about it now. But we have wonderful experts in the company that 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 will definitely take very important decisions mm -hmm. in this company. Uh, when we go back to the the, the beginning of, of of the of the discussion and mm -hmm. and uh, going on uh, in in that field as well, that kind of poster child uh, discussion. Now that you've become or that you will become CEO. Yeah. Uh, you will be even more in the spotlight. And it, it's quite striking when, when we talk about Ava, it's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of talk about you, but as we said, there are co-founders. I mean, you're a yeah. team as well. Mm -hmm. uh, did that ever bother you? Or was it a deliberate, uh, also kind of a decision of the mm -hmm. whole board and the company that whenever we talk about Ava in, in, in articles or in, 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 uh, in the media, it's going to be focused on you? It was a very deliberate decision. Um, so I was leading marketing Honestly, like I was leading marketing, the first press questions came in. I was the natural person to take care of them, given that I was leading marketing. And then I think it just kind of spiraled. Is it also down a gender that thing path. that you, you wouldn't want a man talk about uh, fertility? No, actually, my co-founders do talk about fertility quite a bit, <laughs> <laughs> and they should. They yeah. really should. It's really, a, you know, it's it's usually a couple's hobby. No, I don't. I don't think it's about that. Um, I think. You know, it was. I think it was very much a role-specific thing, um, and. You know, it's always hard. I mean, I think it's always hard to know how gender really plays into the yeah. whole thing. But I think for us, really, the main the main reason behind it was I was leading marketing, and it made sense. And was there never an issue, or kind of, you know, that 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 the men in the company had the impression, why, why is everything so focused on her, mm -hmm. and she's now on the, you know, in, in the list of the thirty to watch on the thirty uh, in Forbes, and and she's she's the one almost, you know, kind of almost synonymous to the to the company, where there never kind of frictions in mm -hmm. that regard. Interestingly, they really weren't, um, but I think that's also is a good proof of strength of all of my co-founders. Um, I think that could lead to friction. I think your question isn't completely, you know, um, out of the ordinary, but actually it really didn't. And I think it really speaks to the fact that A, we're a really strong team, B, we're, we just want this company to be successful. And the PR part is one of the many parts that someone is taking care of, but I don't think I don't think any of us is really strongly motivated by outside applause, really, mm -hmm. for what we're doing. Um, so I think it really speaks to the strength of my co-founders. You are getting a lot of applause also for, for being very outspoken and very open about, about gender issues, about mm -hmm. diversity. That's something very close to your heart. Yeah. I read somewhere that you did the kind of final, final uh, matura uh, work or, or thesis on that very question, you know, yeah. the, the role of women in business. And I think that that's something that drives you as well. And, 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 and you're one of the rare ones who, who, who isn't annoyed when, when she's asked about it, but you, you kind of openly address the issue as well, because mm -hmm. it is still an issue in your, mm -hmm. in your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I wrote about um, board quotas. Exactly. So it was very, yeah. it was very specific um, at that time. Look, I've just very early on, I think probably in my teenage years, I realized that there is a problem and I'm still trying to understand it better. I think people always ask me for solutions. It's not that easy. If the solutions were very, were very obvious, then I think we, we would all try to live it. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized that there is an issue and I think we should all be honest with each other and say there is an issue because a lot of the issue is, is unconscious bias. So if we never talk about it, we will also never get rid of it. So, so it is a topic that is very, very close to my heart. Um, and, and if I can make any difference in it, I, I would like to. And something that might might surprise a lot of people, it's it's not we're not talking about, you know, also the boards of, of, of the established big companies and the traditional companies. You say there's an issue in the startup environment as well and in the startup companies as well, that mm -hmm. they're they're mainly men focused and men concentrated. Why is that? Yeah, I mean they really are. So if we talk about the startup environment, it's important to understand the key actors around it. So I think we 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 have we have a very strong imbalance. And what I mean with that is we have a lack of diversity among founders, 
among investors, mm -hmm. among really the entire environment. And, and the way I look at it is it's an environment that fuels itself. The startup, the startup world is very network driven. It's, re it's really important who you know, who did you go to school with. It, that, that's just, it's a, very, it's a very informal world still to a certain, certain degree. Um, and, and it's also never questioned. I think in the corporate world it's more questioned whether you should take, whether your best friend that you play volleyball with is really the next person you should mm -hmm. fund. In the startup ecosystem that isn't really questioned. That's perfect. If that is your network, great, All right? right? Um, and so I think it fuels itself, right? So the fact that we have a lack of diversity continues to fuel itself because we have more men with a more male network, especially in the US where they still have their fraternity and that's how they know each other. Mm -hmm. So it's just, we have a bit of a vicious cycle here that is really hard to break out of. Um, and I think it did start with the fact that the money was probably managed by men initially. A lot of startups still come out of the technical world where we still have a diversity issue. So I do believe the startup world is to a certain extent a bit of the tip of the iceberg of a problem that we have. And, and the numbers well. are striking. You, you they are. wrote about it as well. Yeah. Uh, I think it's 2% it's, it's, it's of, uh, of all the companies, uh, you know, the money goes to 2% uh, of, of, of women-led people, companies. People debate the 1% yeah. or 2%, yeah. but it's really 1% or 2% of all the venture capital money goes to teams that have at least one female yeah. founder. So it's not even... So we as a company where we have you know, a founder team of four people with one woman, we definitely count as a female founder company. So we are within those one to two percent. In that regard, do you think you can you, you can change things a little bit by becoming CEO maybe as well? Also kind of in, in maybe in, in, in the culture or being being I, I heard something interesting yesterday. Someone told me that, you know, the, the difference between men and women in executive positions is the, the men uh, talk to the people and the women talk with the people. Do you think that's that's true? Do you think you can you can you can bring that in as a CEO as well? So I am in general unbelievably skeptic of generalizations about okay. how women and men do yeah. things. So I would always very strongly disapprove of any statement that says anything like that. Um, and that's why I would also say, no, I don't think me becoming CEO will make a difference because right now Pascal is CEO. Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful CEO. He's very early tried to make sure we are a very diversified company, which we are right now on all levels. Um, so I don't think I will have to come in and make a big difference there. I think we're on a really good track. Uh, speaking of that track, uh, final questions about, about Ava and the future of Ava. You're, you're, you're mainly known for one product, uh, which, is, which is the bracelet you're wearing uh, at the moment as well, uh, a fertility tracker. Where do you see the company going? It, is it going to be a, a kind of a one-track horse uh, company or do you see it, you know, the, 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 the whole field of digital health is, is, is highly interesting and highly profitable as well. Do, do you see yourself going into, into all different kind of aspects there? Yes. Our hope and plan is that we're going to be the leading digital health company for women's health. And I think that's very ambitious. It is. It is. And, you know, I mean, there's a million reasons why I could tell you that we won't reach it. And maybe we'll sit here in a year or so and you're like, ah, you didn't. Um, but the, I think it's important to understand where this ambition comes from. And the ambition really comes from the fact that we in so many areas of women's health, there's completely white space. There is no research that is going on. Women are really left alone in whatever they're doing at this point. Um, and the products that are in the market are either inaccurate or really, really difficult to use. I'm talking about areas like menopause, where really women basically just are not, A, they're ignored, B, they're not given any solution, C, there's almost no research going in any direction to solution there. So there's a huge potential as well. Pregnancy. The mortality rate for women who are pregnant in the U.S. is going up instead of going down. Yeah. Um, contraception to a certain extent, where a lot of women feel that they're trapped in the solutions that we currently have and they don't have the solutions that they'd like to have. So we just have so many areas where I really think that women are frustrated by the fact that there's just nothing happening. So we see our ambition. Our ambition isn't to say we want to be the biggest company on earth and make the most revenue. Our ambition is primarily around doing research in the women's health area and coming out with solutions for women across all different stages of their of their journey. Mm. And we believe that the way to reach that, it goes hand in hand with our financial success in the end, because bringing those products to market, they have to have some kind of return. But, but we really see that on both tracks, the ambition primarily comes from the fact that we just believe that women's health has been ignored for way, way, way too long. And we have the potential to to change that. There's a huge potential. And if I look at if I look ahead 10, 20 years and, and, and final question on, 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 you know, where do you see yourself in 10 or 20 years? Will you be somewhere completely different or having just heard what I heard? Uh, could it be that Lea von Bitter is the, is the, is the next Jeff Bezos or, or Steve Jobs of the, of the uh, digital health industry in 20 years? 
yeah, my my personal aspirations aren't to get even close to, <laughs> to the people that you just mentioned. But look, I think it can go either way. I think the only thing that is certain at this point is whether, you know, wherever I am, my job is going to be very different than what it is right now. Um, that is That has been a constant for my last... 10 years of my life, every year I would say I've done completely different things. And I think that's that's going to remain a constant. And as long as I believe that we have things still to do on the women's health side, which I really believe we're just scratching on the surface right now, then then I will do my best to have an impact there. Lea von Bieder, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.